Understanding How You Learn, a Freshman Seminar Presentation. One of our ongoing themes in Freshman Seminar is finding ways to be engaged with the campus and with your own education. In this particular unit, we're going to discuss how to learn more about your learning styles and what helps you learn and how you can best get the most out of your education by learning how to coordinate um, what's going on in the classroom with how you learn. Think about how you learn. People who research this topic um, generally agree there's no right or best way to learn. There are just differences. Um, some people have a very difficult time listening to a long lecture, but other people, listening is the best way for them to learn. That's one of the reasons um, I record audio with all of these presentations is because a lot of people really need to have that audio component. They need to hear and listen to things. Um, some people really love classroom discussion and other people would rather not hear other people's opinions. They want a more straightforward approach. So as we begin understanding how we learn, keep in mind there are a lot of different aspects to it and hopefully you learn something about yourself and your own learning style. We're going to briefly study how people learn. Those of you who may be going into education or uh, behavioral science fields will delve into some of these same ideas in more detail. Um, there are some different learning theories that we can learning ab learn about, about how people learn and what helps them learn. Um, one is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and again, these are entire fields of study. To boil it down is tough, but basically saying that needs mean, must be met before students can learn. So that makes pretty good common sense, but the idea here is, is that if you aren't having your physical or your physiological needs met, then it's going to be harder for you to learn. That's why students um, in elementary school and, and even high school often get free breakfast and free lunch if their uh, parents income is under a certain level because if they are not having their body needs and their hunger needs taken care of they're gonna have a much harder time learning in the classroom that there's a lot of research that goes into that there's another theory called Bandura's uh, theory of social learning that people learn by observing others um, some of us do um, classroom activities based around that idea there's Schlossberg's theory of transition um, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on uh, the VARC and uh, the Myers-Briggs. So um, again, hopefully this helps you learn a little bit more about your own personality and learning style. I'm going to talk a bit about the VARC Learning Styles Inventory. Uh, and this is a tool that anyone can use to learn more about how you learn. So VARC stands for V-A-R-K, Visual, Oral, Read, Write, and kinesthetic and we're going to learn more about this in the following slides. If you're a visual learner you're going to learn best through seeing things and that means you're going to get your information from things like charts, diagrams, illustrations, graphs, symbols, and other visual things. So handouts are going to be your friend and we've talked already in this class about taking notes and that's one of the reasons that taking notes is a good idea um, for visual learners is that it gets the visual um, right in front of them. Um, if you're an aural learner um, that has to do with audio and being able to hear information. Again, that's why I record these presentations um, for every week, so that the, because there's something that really helps some people by ab being able to hear things and have it processed in their brain that way. Maybe you're one of those people. Some tips for visual learners, um, you can underline or highlight your notes and again that's putting the words and things, um, the ideas back into your brain through your eyes. You can use things like symbols, charts, or graphs to look at your notes. You can use different arrangements of words on the page, um, so for example using bullet points or paragraphs and just kind of rearranging that way. And sometimes redrawing things from memory uh, works as well. A lot of people uh, work especially well with having both a visual and an audio or aural uh, element together. Um, a lot of us learn those things combined. So um, as we keep going tips, keep in mind that even if you identify one of these things um, as your primary way of learning, that it might help for you to um, consider some of the others and combine them. Here are some extra tips for those of you who might be an oral learner. Um, one thing you can do is talk with others in your class and make sure that you're getting good notes um, and just by talking with them and listening to them um, that'll help it go in your brain one more time. Um, a lot of people read their notes um, into um, 
if there's something they can record on their phone or even something uh, digital media otherwise um, there are little hand recorders you can get um, or you can record lectures a lot of instructors are happy about letting you uh, record lectures um, other people read their notes aloud and that way they hear it again um, even asking yourself questions and speaking your answers can be a really big help so you can hear that and it goes into your brain through your ears and that will really help you learn perhaps you're a read write learner and you prefer to learn information displayed by words so for you if you have a text in front of you and you can read it that's really going to be your primary way of learning and again note taking is important for these folks as well um, because they're going to hear things and by listening and putting it in paper and then being able to read it or again just the act of writing really helps for me personally if people tell me something I can hear it I don't remember it very well I have to write it down and it doesn't even matter if I save what I've written down just the fact that I've actively written it down really helps me and then we have K kinesthetic learners those are people who really need the hands-on help they prefer to learn by touching or doing so again you can tell them directions you can have them read directions but what's really gonna help a kinesthetic learner is to actually look um, at it while they're doing it and learn through those motions for those with a read-write preference, um, again, you can read or write, uh, rewrite your notes um, multiple times. Sometimes that really helps. Sometimes just reading over your notes, notes silently is going to be sufficient. Um, sometimes organizing your diagrams or flowcharts and changing them, them into more statements. So taking them from a way just being visual and putting them into words can be very helpful. Um, some students find it helpful to write pretend questions uh, for tests. And you'll find some professors like to use this in the classroom and have students uh, come up with test questions or quiz questions. And that's not because the professor's lazy, but because they understand for learning styles, some students really benefit from doing this activity. Kinesthetic learners, again, they need to really work all of their senses in uh, when it comes to learning. And um, again, I can find uh, different pieces of all learning styles that really help with me. But I'm the type of person where if I just listen to directions or if I talk to somebody on the phone and hear what they're saying, I don't really get much out of it. I actually struggle to keep paying attention and, and listening um, if all I'm doing is hearing something. I need to be physically active in doing something if I'm going to learn how to do something. Now I enjoy reading and writing. I benefit from those a lot as far as knowledge. Um, but when it comes to learning a skill, I have to have that hands-on component or I just completely lose it. Some people are that way even more with the knowledge and have a hard time getting knowledge unless they're doing something kinesthetic with it. So what kinesthetic learners need um, and what you can do if you are a kinesthetic learner to help is to find ways to use your senses. Um, so what that means is that when you're taking notes, try to think of real world examples. Maybe talk with your professor or visit during office hours and say, so what are some practical examples of this? Um, other people, when they move and gesture, just by having those motions associated with reading or speaking um, can make a big difference for them and really help them learn quite a bit. One way of getting more engaged with your uh, learning is to find learning teams. And some classes do this more naturally, um, or they have you do this for group projects. But as you get more involved with your major and find more people in your major, sometimes it helps to just sort of find these organic or uh, more orchestrated learning teams. And sometimes that involves finding people who have different learning styles than you, uh, so you can all help each other as well. Um, you can also help split up workloads, um, sometimes for projects or for learning things within classes, um, especially if you're doing things like making flashcards and um, rewriting notes and doing visual things or whatever. Um, math and science classes tend to lend themselves to this quite a bit, but you can also use this for classes that require a lot of reading, where everybody, of course, is going to read the assignments, but you break these up into chapters or you break them into groups and then you each kind of educate and help each other um, learn some of these things from your from your readings um, by explaining it to each other and by breaking it up that makes the load a little lighter and everybody benefits. When you create learning teams it helps to keep teams pretty small you don't want to have the class involved in a huge class um, because then you can interact a little bit more uh, personally and a lot of people interact better in groups of four to six for example. Um, also within a group as you get to know each other and trust each other you can hold each other accountable a little bit more to make sure everybody's contributing. 
Um, you can use your team more than just studying for exams, but for you know double checking um, ideas about homework and things like that. Again, we're not talking about cheating, but we're talking about learning how to collaborate a little bit on the learning concept of it, even if you're doing your assignments separately. You also want to find people who are going to um, be strong uh, quality group members and uh, pull their own weight, but also don't just pick people like you. You want some diversity. You want people who learn differently than you and have different perspectives and can add different ideas. That's very important in college. Um, and again, there's kind of a list of uh, qualities here that you want to look for when you're picking someone as well to make sure that they're going to be a quality member and contribute well. Here's a good list of how to use learning teams. Um, and I'm just going to read these through and expand a little bit here and there. Um, first of all, you can uh, compare notes with each other um, and just kind of see um, what you came up with in your notes and where you can add and fill in some of the gaps and things you may have missed. Um, again, you can divvy up reading assignments and then kind of help educate each other. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't do all the reading, but again, you can uh, contribute and have specific sections where the person is responsible for learning that a little bit better and helping people. That way you've all got a little something invested. Um, same with research. Um, there, are, there are times when you can have group assignments and work with uh, research this way, but even if there's general research for the class that you can work on. Um, sometimes instructors and professors like if you come in there with a group and ask for a conference with a group of people so that you can all kind of uh, get the same information and work together. Um, of course, preparing for tests is another one, going over tests after that and comparing um, where you need to improve and what you did well on. Um, again, even taking units and taking small things and teaching each other and asking each other questions. Sometimes we don't always want to ask the professors questions about it or questions come up as we're reading or preparing that we're not able to reach out to the professor and so um, helping each other through asking questions is really a big benefit. Working with groups brings up a lot about personalities and um, that that's a good way to lead into talking about the Myers-Briggs personality indicator um, which is a tool and of course this helps us learn how to better work with and get along with others. We're also going to look at this in terms of how it can teach us a little bit more about our own learning styles and what will help us. Kind of the key idea behind Myers-Briggs is extroversion versus introversion. And a good way of thinking about that is how we get our energy. Um, I've studied this a fair amount. Um, I've taken college classes where we applied this personality theory to literature and that was the whole point of the class. Um, I've read a really good book um, or two here and there about this as well. So if you want to learn more about this, I'm happy to work with you and talk with you privately or, or correspond about it. Um, in general, again, thinking about where do you get your energy? Do you get your energy from um, being active and engaging with other people, lots of social interaction? Um, one way to think about it is after you spend time with other people, do you feel energized? Or after spending time with other people, do you feel really drained? Um, that might mean you're an introvert. Introverts tend to be more thought-oriented. Um, they would rather have more one-on-one -on -one and, and deep and meaningful social interaction. So, for example, they're not really going to be interested in having a lot of small talk. Um, and they're going to feel most recharged and most refreshed after spending time alone. Um, full disclosure, I am a full-blown introvert. Um, so I understand how a lot of these things work. Um, from the introvert point of view, but again, I've read, I've read books to better understand extroverts and how to work alongside people who um, may be similar or different from how I am. Another way of thinking about Myers-Briggs then is uh, they also focus on sensing versus intuition. That's how we perceive the world. Um, so, for example, somebody who is a sensor, somebody who senses, again, they're going to uh, be more hands-on. They're going to focus on facts and details. They're going to be more interested in reality as opposed to creative and imagination type things. Um, intuitives pay more attention to looking at the world in terms of patterns um, or just general impressions of things. They may not be as plugged into reality um, and everyday life and practical matters. They're going to think more about the future or what could be. Um, what could we do with this? What are some ideas? Um, again, these are very sometimes these types of people clash when they try to work together and it's important to understand where different people are coming from but also where we are coming from so we can better play to those strengths. The Myers-Briggs tool um, 
focuses on several different uh, types and kind of contrasts um, different things. We just looked at um, a slide with a couple of those things. Um, those two different uh, some categories and here are two more categories that they focus on so really they talk about four different realms um, of different personality types another then is thinking versus feeling and this re relates to how people make decisions some people are thinkers and they want facts they want data they want consistency and they want to make their decisions that way other people tend to make decisions based on how they feel and so if you know somebody who says oh, uh, you know, I just have a gut feeling about this, as opposed to dealing with facts, those person, uh, those people may be more feelers. Um, feelers also tend to consider other people's feelings. Um, we've talked a little bit about emotional intelligence. That's going to be a lot more important to feelers um, in, in general. But they're also going to use emotions to uh, make their decisions. And sometimes um, all of these different uh, categories and all these different types of people there are dangers in being too extreme and obviously people who have um, too much emotion based again that can lead to difficult things also we have versus perceiving perceiving and that relates to how we schedule today uh, our day so people who like structure and they want firm decisions well I just want a yes or no that's going to be a judger other people are perceivers and they want flexibility they want a little bit more nuance to things. They don't really want to tell you yes or no. They want to be able to change if they need to. Um, and again, you can see how people often tend to lean one way or the other with these personality types, and that can affect a lot of realms in life, including how we learn and how we interact with other people in our college setting. So let's talk about how these theories with Myers-Briggs and the tool um, and what that can tell us about learning. So if somebody has a temperament um, that's a term that Myers-Briggs uses a lot, is what is somebody's temperament? And um, if you're an extrovert, then you're going to learn needing a lot of direct experience. You're going to do well with other people around and having a lot of conversations, group work, things like that. Um, that's going to be big for you. If you're an introvert, you prefer to work alone. Um, you might not really like working with a group very much. Um, you like work where you can just kind of squirrel away into your own private place and be quiet and solitary. Um, you like to listen and watch. Um, you're somebody who's going to reflect quite a bit. And before you attempt something, you're going to want to observe it. That's a big thing with uh, introverts. You want to see somebody else do it and, and watch it before you try it for yourself. If you are somebody who is a sensor, um, again, you're going to use experience and common sense to solve problems. Whereas an intuitive, again, um, if they're learning, they're going to want to work in very short sessions. They're going to be trying all kinds of new things. Um, they're going to be looking at the big picture, which is nice. Um, those of us in the humanities appreciate intuitives and tend to be uh, intuitives a lot of times because we love theories and abstract ideas. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about learning disabilities. Um, and some of us have an idea in our mind about what a learning disability is. Uh, and we need to kind of reapproach that because it, it can mean a lot more than what most of us are familiar with. Um, learning disabilities are often recognized and diagnosed in grade school, but a lot of students come into college really never having been diagnosed with learning disabilities. Sometimes the way that elementary and uh, even secondary education um, are built to work with certain learning styles and things more than others, and sometimes people with learning disabilities um, work really well with a certain learning style and so their learning disability isn't really recognizable or diagnosed um, until they get to college and they encounter other types of um, issues. So basically when we think about a learning disability we're talking about um, a person's ability to interpret what they see or hear or to link information across different parts of the brain. And as I mentioned learning disabilities can be a lot wider um, in their definition than what some of us have considered. And learning disabilities can affect math, they can affect reading and writing, and they can even affect things like their coordination and self-control and the ability to pay attention. In general, learning disabilities have two main categories, uh, attention disorders and cognitive disorders. Attention disorders, um, m many of us have heard of attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, those who are working through a learning disability and uh, working through education um, with an attention disorder often have difficulty organizing tasks. Um, they have a hard time getting work done and completing things. 
they're not often um, seem to be listening to directions. They may struggle with following directions. And of course, uh, many of us are familiar with the idea that they're easily distracted. On the other hand, we have cognitive disorders. Um, that includes dyslexia, people who um, struggle with reading and with sound, and also people who have certain writing challenges. And again, we can dig really a lot more deeply into all of these things. These are just really general things. But if you think this might be you, again, go talk to, um, at the college, the ADA coordinator. Um, maybe this is something that you've never been diagnosed, but you're really starting to become concerned. Um, and maybe there is a learning disability. Maybe there are just other things that uh, we can talk with and help you adjust. Um, but go see somebody in the ADA office um, on the second floor um, near the library if you do have any questions. So if you're considering if you have a learning disability or maybe you want to work through this list um, so that you can better recognize it in others as you get into your fields and start working with others. Um, so here's some questions, just kind of a basic screening. One is, do you perform poorly on tests even if, when you have studied and are capable of performing better? So you feel like you know the material, but that's not reflected in how you perform in the test. Do you have trouble spelling words? Uh, do you work harder than your classmates at basic reading and writing? Again, these are some basic uh, um, flags that you can look at to see if maybe you do have a learning disability. Perhaps your instructors tell you that your performance in class is inconsistent. So, for example, you might answer cor questions correctly in class, but you struggle and uh, you get them incorrect on a written test. Um, do you have a really short attention span, or do your family members or instructors say you do things without thinking? Again, these might be some flags that you have a learning disability. So as we went through those questions, um, keep in mind, responding yes to any of these questions doesn't mean that you have a disability. Um, learning disability is a learning difference, but it's not related to uh, intelligence. Um, again, these are red flags where if they start adding up, maybe all together, uh, if you answered yes to quite a few of those, then you would maybe want to go talk to somebody in the ADA office or visit a doctor. Um, keep in mind that learning disabilities, as mentioned, are more of a learning difference and actually often are just sort of an extreme version of what we would call these learning differences and learning styles. Um, there are a lot of people, you can see a brief list here, and there, there are much larger lists out there if you uh, Google them. And you can see that many of the most intelligent, successful people in history have had what we would label learning disabilities. Um, and the, the most important thing is getting yourself some help and uh, learning how to succeed. As it relates to any of the things that we've talked about in this presentation, um, I highly encourage you to visit the ACE Center, or uh, in previous weekly we call it CSA, so you may still run into some materials that call it that. Um, they're open 8 to 4.30, and they do have a lot of assistance. And um, it could be that you just need some tutoring on a specific subject, they can hook you up. Um, if there are some disability services that you may need or want to start inquiring, talk to them. They can just help you with test taking skills, and a lot of students just go in there to get a little bit of an extra bump, a little bit of an extra um, set of tips. They can help you in terms of using computers, um, thinking about career assistance, and we have um, somebody on staff here who can help a little bit more with career assistance. They can point you in his or her direction. And also, um, they don't directly do advising, but if you do have advising questions um, where maybe you wanted to ask them and got the ball rolling, they could go hook you up with an advisor if you are not already. Let's review. First of all, learn about and accept your un unique learning preferences as well as your personality. Those can really help you um, and help you develop um, other aspects of both your academic and social life quite a bit. Um, you can use your learning style to develop study strategies that are really going to help you and work best for you. Um, visit the ACE Center if you have any need for assistance. Um, we've talked in the past about assessing your emotional intelligence, but again, this relates to the personality. And again, if you have a learning disability, um, visit the ACE Center. Um, hopefully this presentation was very helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to email or message me directly. This is Joel Thomas, your instructor. Thanks everyone for your attention.